All right, welcome to uh, another session with our uh, customer GM Financial, uh, one of our partners that we have been working with. Uh, today, we're hosting a panel discussion on preparing for behavioral interviews. Uh, you probably have heard of, of behavioral interviews a lot. Uh, we're going to uh, definitely provide you insights and tips and tools to uh, really ace that interview uh, and also stand out during the recruiting process. Uh, we want you to put your best foot forward as you learn from these mentors on how they conduct their uh, behavioral interviews and uh, prepare candidates for success. Um, and we all thank you for joining. We're gonna have a few poll questions to get started just to uh, hear how um, you uh, are, uh, have, have done in behavioral interviews in the past. Um, so engage in that poll question uh, as we go around the room and uh, introduce ourselves. Um, uh, and then uh, stick with uh, the session throughout the, th through the end and we'll have another poll question to really understand how, what progress uh, you made in terms of your conference level with behavioral interviews. So, um, and uh, throughout the process, if you have any questions um, throughout the session, if you have any questions, please, please uh, use the chat. There's a Q&A channel uh, in uh, Zoom here and we will get to your questions. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it over to our moderator, Randy. Uh, you wanna take it over? Yeah, thank you, Kanal. Um, again, as Kanal mentioned, my name's Randy Emelo and I'm a program strategist here at Mentor Spaces. And I'm joined today by uh, two of our mentor panelists and uh, Rod, who is a program manager uh, for some of the young and junior talent program uh, within the organization. And they're, they're, so we have a wealth of understanding about how interviewing works at GM Financial and really looking forward to digging into this topic. So as we get started, uh, why don't we go ahead and have our panelists take a few moments and just interview or interview, um, <laughs> introduce yourself. <laughs> I'm all nervous, like I'm doing an interview. <laughs> uh, let's start with Jennifer. If you would uh, tell us a little, tell the audience a little bit about who you are and um, what you do there, at GM Financial. Sure. Thanks, Randy. Hi, everybody. I'm excited to be here today. My name is Jennifer Reed. I'm SVP of Portfolio Analytics within our Credit Risk Management Department here at GM Financial. And I've been with the company about 21 years, which is hard to believe. I've been in the same department the entire time. I started as an entry analyst right out of a master's program at TCU and um, worked my way up and have been really fortunate to grow my career with GMF, which is just a, a fantastic company. I get to work with great people each day. And super high level, my team focuses on forecasting and data analytics for our North America loan and lease portfolios. And we support a variety of internal departments, including accounting, finance, pricing, um, servicing, just to, just to name a few. Great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And it's always good to have you. You're always a, a kind of a sparkling light, I think, as a mentor. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of a wisdom and a lot of energy. I agree. Uh, oh, thank hello. You. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Rod, why don't you take a moment, her moment, and introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Rod Hooker, um, AVP of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at GM Financial. I've uh, been with the company for nine years now. And uh, yeah, just like uh, Jennifer, I'm excited to be here today. Uh, mainly what I do for GM Financial is uh, support all of our uh, diversity, equity, and uh, inclusion related initiatives, uh, such as mentoring programs and uh, councils, things like that, in order to help us cultivate a uh, more inclusive environment where team members can uh, belong and thrive uh, within our, our culture. So um, definitely excited about the discussion today and look forward to connecting with everyone on the call. Thank you so much, Rod. Um, as we get started, I, I need to share with everyone that, you know, my partner, uh, Gretchen, just went through a behavioral interviewing process just over the last couple of weeks. And I can tell you the home was a little bit on pins and needles as uh, she was preparing. And it doesn't matter how, uh, what your age is or what your experience level is, anytime you have to get interviewed for something that you really want, it's, it's gonna bring forward a lot of anxiety, 
It's going to, um, there's going to be a lot of self-doubt. There's going to be some other things in play. So I'm really, uh, I'm really glad that we're talking about this topic and uh, really looking at it from kind of a wisdom level. How can we make the most of these opportunities that come our way? And how do we get our best foot put forward? So with that, we're going to jump right in to, um, to our first question. Um, and, you know, uh, let's start with, um, let's start with Rod a little bit about, I'm going to deviate a little bit from some of the questions we had asked. Um, what are changes that you've noticed that's happening within interviewing today versus, say, two and a half years ago? Yeah, I think uh, really some of the changes that I've noticed is just a more focus or emphasis on um, behaviors in particular situations, um, kind of, you know, what have you done um, in this particular environment or in this particular situation to really assess uh, what that uh, candidate is capable 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 of and just kind of their history and performance and things like that um, I, I know compared to where when I started with the company there wasn't as much focus on that but over the past couple of years we've really been really intentional about focusing on behaviors and just how candidates react in certain situations uh, to the point where we're actually training um, our leaders uh, to conduct those interviews and also at the end of it making sure that the the results are coming out um, uh, fair uh, that there's no disparity um, so you know it's, it's not just one person that's sitting on this panel uh, to interview a candidate you know we have multiple team members multiple backgrounds multiple pers perspectives uh, that's involved with the interview as well and afterwards they're getting together to discuss um, their perspectives um, on the interview and the candidate um, in order to come to a conclusion. So um, it's, it's definitely more technical um, compared to what it used to be, where it maybe it was just one manager or leader in the interview with a candidate and just going off of that one perspective um, is, is expanded a lot more in order to include those diverse perspectives in order to make sure that we are selecting the right candidate and making the right decision. Great, thank you so much, uh, Rod. That's a, that's a you know good broad understanding of current practices within GM Financial around interviewing, and um, I, I also found that interesting. Again, just going to my personal experience with, with uh, my partner Gretchen, that you know uh, I was used to them being like lots of different rounds of interview, and then, you know you might eventually get to a team interview. But now it seems as if things are being truncated, condensed, focused, getting a group of people, you know, once, you know, the recruiter has passed you on as uh, prepared uh, for the interview, which that's, is that still a step with GM Financial? Like you'd probably talk to a recruiter and, and they would ask you a few softball questions and see how you respond and then mm -hmm. uh, maybe help coach you a little bit because their job is also to help make sure that you're prepared and ready. Right. Um, and then you would go into this kind of uh, larger inter interview kind of setting. How long, I'm just asking a question, how long, um, how long could you expect this interview to last? Um, on average, anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour uh, for, for most of the interviews um, with some of those earlier interview steps, like with a recruiter, um, those are typically shorter, maybe 30 minutes in, in length. And now, as you, you brought up over the past couple of years, um, due to the pandemic and things like that, we've embraced uh, technology to help us with that piece. So uh, we, we have the ability to conduct some of those early interviews um, on demand to where you know a, a candidate can record themselves um, responding to some of those kind of preliminary in interview questions um, on their own time and uh, we receive that feedback and, and move forward with the interview interview from there but um, yeah this is it on average it's anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour uh, the more technical the role the longer it could be um, but that's about the average and also sorry to Jennifer we're going to get to you in just a second 
But another question, how many of these are now done in person versus virtual? Yeah, I would say majority. Uh, <laughs> as of right now, majority are, doing, uh, are done virtual uh, because, you know, we're still in a hybrid work model. Um, so, of course, with the emergence of the technology, we've embraced it. Uh, we partner up with a, a really good vendor um, to kind of help us with that piece uh, to execute some of those interviews. And it's, um, it's, it's going, along, going along very well. Uh, we've been able to identify some really great candidates um, from that process, uh, as well as to remain the integrity of the interview process at the same time. Good, excellent. So as we uh, kind of roll forward with our questions a little bit later, I'll be interested to hear from your perspective, uh, what, uh, what are some of the things people should keep in mind if they're engaging in a virtual interview versus a face-to-face? -face? And, mm -hmm. um, and also is interesting that you also, in some of the positions I'm hearing, uh, that you're using a video platform as well. So mm -hmm how to make the best use of, of that opportunity. So Jennifer, let's turn our attention to you for a moment. Uh, you're a senior, uh, you know, both you and Rod are, are senior uh, leaders in the organization. So my assumption is that you probably lead a team of people and, and people under you are doing a lot of the hiring and hiring processes. So from your vantage point, um, what are you looking for from, a, a, from potential candidates uh, what do you want to hear coming out of these interviews? Yeah, that's a great question. So, yes, I've, I've done a lot of interviewing over the years. Um, more recently, I have not been interviewing as much, but my leadership, leadership team does, and they've been running quite a few interviews recently as we've been trying to fill some open positions. Um, they've all been virtual or remote. So I chatted with them a little bit earlier today to, to get some of their thoughts as well. And uh, we do run behavioral-based interviews, which, like Rod mentioned, we didn't used to. But over the last, you know, kind of, you know, seven to nine years or so, um, that's really been our approach. And I, I've interviewed both ways, sort of the non-behavioral and also the behavioral. And I feel like um, we get a lot more out of behavioral-based interviews. We get a much better picture of the candidate's personality, um, a much truer view of their past experiences and how those can be leveraged in, in the role that they're applying for. So instead of just a cursory review of the candidate's resume, um, we ask, you know, really specific questions, sort of open-ended, you know, tell me about a time that such and such, or give me an example of a time when, you know, you face a challenging situation at work, for example. So we're really trying to draw on their past experiences because past experience does predict future behavior. And I think that's really the foundation of, of the behavioral-based interview. We definitely leave time at the end. You know, Rod mentioned some of the interviews can get more technical. Um, we do interview for technical positions. So we also want to make sure we get a sense for the technical skill sets of the candidates that we're interviewing as well. So we do spend some time on that too. But I would say the, the majority of time in the interview is really spent on um, the behavioral-based questions. Um, and with that, we really like to see specific examples. Um, so, you know, we like to encourage people to avoid hypotheticals, you know, don't start off a response by saying, well, in that situation, I would have done or I would do this. We're really looking for true real life examples that the candidate can share. And so um, just following up on that real briefly, uh, Jennifer, um, you know, these specific examples, if I were to ask you, um, you know, tell me a time when the last outstanding hire you made. Yeah, great question. In fact, we um, had someone start yesterday. It was his first day. He's an entry analyst and um, he had a fantastic interview um, and something that set him apart is um, a couple of things. First of all, when we ask the behavioral-based questions, we really like the candidate to provide enough background and context, talk about the actions that they took, and then describe the results. So sort of a you know start to, to finish full complete response. And then we like to make sure that they can articulate that clearly. 
um, without meandering, without wandering, which can be hard to do because we know interviews are nerve wracking, right? Um, and I think they're, they're even more nerve wracking in the remote environment because you're not getting a sense for the vibe in the room and body language and some of the nonverbal cues that you get in person. So we understand they're nerve wracking, but all that to say, we look for concise responses and then the interviewer, if they, if that person wants to know more, will dig in and ask follow up questions. So, so that's one thing that set this candidate apart was really his ability to concisely answer the questions with very specific examples, but giving enough context for the interviewer to get a good understanding of, of um, you know, how that person responded in a given situation. I'd say the other big thing that really sets people apart and, and certainly set that candidate apart is the type of questions that they in turn ask the interviewer. Um, we always like to hear questions from our candidates, um, whether it's about company culture or about the team dynamic. Um, this person specifically asked about what his first you know, 30 days would look like with the team versus 60 versus 90. He asked about training opportunities and development opportunities. So some really great questions that showed that he um, is not just looking for a job, but he's looking for uh, a path, you know, a path to develop his skills and develop in his career. The other thing that always set folks apart um, when I was interviewing was, um, you know, I, I like to see that they know a little bit about GM Financial. I think that's really important. I've interviewed people in the past who really had no idea what GM Financial was about or what we did, or um, they just had the completely wrong um, interpretation of what GM Financial does. So, you know, that's pretty easy to do. Just, just spend some time on Google. We've got a great website. So, you know, I think it's some, some kind of easy things that the candidates can do to, to help set themselves apart. Thank you so much for your response. And you gave a good uh, behavioral response where you talked about, you know, the situation, the task, the action, and then the result. So that's, you know, for those of you who are cued into behavioral interviewing, that's the pattern. Uh, they call it the STAR response. And uh, keep that in mind. That'll help to lower your anxiety if you can just get that little framework in your mind. And as you, as Jennifer said, it's really important to be concise, stay on the point, make sure that you select uh, a real life example. And we can all tell the difference between when you're sharing something real and when you're MSUing. You know what that is, making stuff up. So, uh, and, and that, will, that will definitely uh, be a red flag to anyone interviewing if you try to make something up. It's better to talk about a personal failure experience and what you learn from it as a result than it is to simply try to create a hero story where there isn't one, if that makes sense. Um, Rod, what other uh, kind of suggestions? I mean, Jennifer did an awesome job. It's almost yeah, like absolutely. She, you know, uh, what yeah. else uh, do you think? How else can these candidates prepare? And I love, the, by the way, Jennifer, tying it back, you know, being able to speak about why this organization, why this job, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and I've sat in on hundreds of interviews and it's almost always a, an immediate disconnect when someone really, you can tell they have no idea who you, who, who you are and what you do or what your organization or culture stands for. And when they can't tie that to that per, their personal interests and passion, well, then you're just like, well, this person's just, you know, they're looking for filler work. You know, they're, they're looking for something while they actually find what they really want. And, and uh, anyway, you want to be careful with, with leaving that impression. Right. Rod? Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm definitely going to just piggyback on, on what you were saying. You, you, you absolutely want to make sure that you're able to kind of convey your desire and, and interest and passion um, for that opportunity to come and work for that company. Um, and, and at the same time, while you're doing that, um, just, just keep in mind that the reason why the company is going through this process of um, the behavior-based interviews is because those questions are built on uh, specific competencies that's related uh, to that position. So, you know, whether it's, it's regarding teamwork, um, attention to detail, or, you know, anything within that, that space, the questions are set up to try to identify, okay, so tell me about an opportunity where 
you know, you were putting in into a position where you had to work with someone, um, but you know, that experience didn't go well. How, how did you handle that? What was the situation? What was the, the action? And then what was the result? Um, to give us a better sense and understanding of what possible future behavior um, could be. Now, is that an absolute or is a 100%? No, you know, there's definitely opportunities to learn and grow from, from different experiences that we, we, we've gone through. Uh, but at the same time, while you are in the process of explaining that um, particular situation, mention that, you know, make note of that, of, of how you've grown and the lesson that you were able to learn from that um, um, so that the, the employer company can understand um, um, where, where you currently are uh, with that particular competency. Yeah, thank you so much, Rod. You guys are giving such a, a good wealth of understanding around the process. Um, how might someone go out and kind of prepare themselves for um, for behavioral based interviewing, any any thoughts? Uh, either one of you can jump on that. Yeah, I mean, you you can also absolutely go on the internet um, and find multiple resources about uh, behavior based interviews and and the star method, uh, which is what we encourage uh, most of our candidates to do. Uh, we even sometimes provide like little links um, or information that the candidate can use to help prepare for the interview. Um, at the same time, practice with someone, you know, pr practice with a, a friend, uh, family member, uh, just kind of going through some of those different examples, interview questions that you maybe find online uh, to help you prepare. Yeah, that's a really good one. Um, I spent three days asking my partner questions. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> And the, as Rod mentioned, the questions are not going to be, the, you know, they're not going to be a mystery. Uh, you know, if you look at the job description, the job description will have tasks and responsibilities and skills and demonstrated behaviors that typically are associated with it. And that's what the questions are going to be about. So if you're in customer service, expect to hear questions like, uh, tell me a time when you had to deal with a frustrated customer. How did you deal with that? Or if it's a teamwork question, tell me a time when you were in conflict with someone. How did you resolve it? And it, it's going to, you know, they, they can be a little challenging because they're going to come at you and, and you can easily interpret them as negative. Yeah. Uh, but really what the, uh, the question is designed is, to help you in difficult situations that you face, what have you done? You know, how did you handle this? Not what would you do? Not what do you think you, someone else ought to do? What did you do? Right. Because you can always fall back on what you learned from it. If you didn't, you know, my initial impulse was to, and that what I later found out it was wrong because, yeah. you know, and that's okay. You know, that also puts forward the fact that you have a learning attitude, a growth mindset as mm -hmm. a, uh, you know, is a terminology that is used to talk about someone who doesn't see difficulties as as barriers, but really opportunities to kind of learn and grow and gain insight. Um, along with some of um, this, uh, let's see, how can a mentor help you with uh, with interviewing, Jennifer? Yeah, I, I think mentors can help with so many different aspects of, um, you know, career development, including um, preparing for interviews, right? The, the mentor could ask some questions um, based on the job description of the position that the candidate wants to interview for. Um, they could help the candidate go through a mock interview, even give tips on, you know, what to wear, what about a background in a, in a remote environment. Um, so I think I think a mentor can be a really valuable resource for for preparing for an interview. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Kind of a softball question, but uh, <laughs> it, it, but it's one that I'm not sure we use enough. So that would be kind of situational based mentoring, where you're really looking for just some rapid feedback from someone who, again, is inside the company culture. Uh, you know, the the people within GM Financial know the value that GM's uh, financial strives to perform in the marketplace and the culture. And so they can really help to tailor your responses 
and give you feedback around you just if nothing else help to make you more comfortable with the process and less intimidated by it mm -hmm. um, in a sense get your fear out of the way so we can get at that experience rod one other question i was going to ask and uh then our time is up unfortunately um what could someone do if they're coming out of a school situation and they're entry level and they really don't have a lot of work experience? How would they prepare for these kind of interviews? Yeah, you can absolutely refer to your collegiate experience um, to, for some of those interview questions. Um, definitely, it, it doesn't have to be anything within corporate America or actually work related. Uh, we encourage students to use their um, college experience um, to answer some of those questions as long as it's equivalent um, to what that question is 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 looking for um so you know working in a team setting attention to detail um owning up to mistakes um working with the, the, all those things you've basically come across um as a student um at the university so um you can use that experience to respond to those interviews questions in that way yeah thank you so much and thank you jennifer uh, and uh, what an you know a difficult topic. We didn't really get into a lot on say the virtualized side, but maybe one or two tips um, from other uh, sessions that that I've moderated on this topic. Make sure that you have a nice, clean like both Jennifer and Rod have perfect backgrounds. You know, it's clean. There's not a lot of clutter. There's not an unmade bed behind you. Uh, there's not an open doorway with people walking by in different stages of dress. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you're kind of uh, quiet, you have good lighting, people can read your facial expressions and uh, make sure that you're connecting. Practice looking into the camera and speaking directly into the camera. And for some people, that's a little more difficult than others. But we've all had a lot of pandemic practice. So uh, just lean on those skills. Um, thank you so much for uh, your contributions today, and I hope everyone on the line is uh, really considering GM Financial as your next career move. It's an awesome organization. Uh, Kanal, how about over to you? Thank you. Uh, we have a question from the audience if we have time to address this. Um, okay. Uh, as an employer, this actually comes uh, from the direction of being a, a, a you know, with a new employer, how do you train your recruiters and managers on behavioral based interviewing? Um, just in, that's a very you know good question on the other side of the spectrum that I wanted to see if uh, Rod or Jennifer wanted to address. Yeah, that sure, they, I can, I can take yeah, go ahead, Jennifer, go ahead. Oh, oh, so you can probably answer this better than I can, but um, our leaders do go through some pretty great training about mm -hmm. behavioral based interviews. They spend quite a bit of time. I can't recall exactly how long, but it, it's hours worth of training. Um, and then we definitely prepare thoroughly before every interview. We spend a lot of time looking at the on-demand video that Rod mentioned or, you know, notes from the recruiter along with thorough review of the resume and really spending time focusing on which competencies we want to address in the interview and ask questions about. But Rod, you probably know more details on that than I do. Right. Nope. Nope. You answered it perfectly. <laughs> yeah. So there, there's some specific training that goes into it. Um, it's not just people winging it. <laughs> All awesome. right. Thanks so much. Can all? Yeah, thank you. Um, so to close this out, we have a poll question here. So please go ahead and respond to this. We'd love to see if you're uh, interested in applying to GM financial opportunities and also just get feedback on um, how this session helped increase your confidence. Uh, I also left a link to uh, apply to any opportunities that you're interested in at GM Financial. They have a number of opportunities across data and analytics, uh, marketing, finance, obviously as a financial company. Uh, so check out the opportunities on their career website. If you do apply, please message us in the concierge channel um, and let us know that you have applied and we'll make sure that your application gets reviewed by Rod and their team. Um, and as an attendee, you'll, the information will be passed along uh, to the GM financial team to um, help you understand what opportunities are available. 
Um, and then finally, if you're interested in connecting with a mentor from GM Financial, please also message us in the concierge room. I did ask a poll question around this. So uh, look forward to making connections with folks after uh, this session. Uh, we actually had another question come in. Uh, yeah, we did. I was going to bring that up quickly. So yeah. the question is uh, from Rebecca. Um, she's been in, uh, has international work experience and now has her MBA. Is she required to start at an entry level or look at an entry level position or an experience level position? I think it really depends on the position. Um, you know, some some of our entry level positions within my team specifically prefer a master's degree, um, but there are definitely other positions in the company that don't require a master's degree for an entry level and could start at a you know maybe a, a mid level analyst position instead. So I think that that really depends on the team and on on the position itself. I think there there's some variation there. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I wouldn't let that um, hold you back from pursuing some of those opportunities that may be more mid-level, uh, as Jennifer mentioned, uh, because there is a possibility for that. Yes, the job descriptions usually do a pretty good job of expressing, okay, master's preferred or master's required and you know, two to four years of experience required, for example, or one to three years. So they, our, our job descriptions are pretty, pretty descriptive with that, which also helps. But yeah, I agree with yeah. you. I don't let that be your application. As long as the skills are transferable, it should be fine. Great. Um, all right, so we're ready to close this out. We actually have a, another session that GM Financial is doing on April 12th. So come back and uh, visit uh, us again uh, with uh, uh, folks from uh, the Keys. It's a program uh, that GM Financial has on financial literacy. So if you're looking to build your wealth or uh, looking to maintain uh, your wealth, uh, this is a really great session uh, to understand how you can uh, manage your finances. So um, that's going to be on uh, April 12th. This is a really awesome program that we've been working on uh, uh, scheduling with GM Financial for a while and uh, looking forward to hosting that at 5 p.m. Eastern time uh, on that date. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close this out. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your insights and uh, participating today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.